I was taking a shower and uh, kind of hating it because <laughs> I shaved before I took a shower and man, I hate shaving. Boy, my poor face. It hates it too. <laughs> you know what's kind of neat was uh, before I start talking about when God told me to shower, because you know that's coming, because every time I get in the bathtub or shower, God talks to me. It's like, man, I could market that. <laughs> hey, new new way of God talking in the shower, in the tub, in the quiet of the vernacular of wherever it is that in your house that is quiet. But you know, something else I was thinking of that I forgot all about was that, you know, I really get a kick out of God. First of all, you know, that's why I do this, you know, with bluntly is I get a kick out of God, you know, and I don't mean, you know, kicking the butt or kicking the head, but well, maybe kicking the head because that's kind of a humorous way of saying you really enjoy it, but I get thrilled over my relationship with God because it's so real. I mean, literally, <laughs> really, really real. <laughs> and I mean, really. I'll give you an example, like, every day, well, okay, not every day, maybe two or three times a day, or two or three times a week, you know, something unusual happens that, you know, it's between God and I that my wife doesn't know about, you know, and I love it, because it's like, man, it's just such a, a neat thing about either, you could call it the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, or whatever you want to call it, but this is the way God and I work, because you see, it's done with nonverbal communication. Ooh, there's one of those buzzwords for, you know, your your power positive thinking people and your, you know, dynamic speaking engagement people, you know, and all these people that evaluate whether or not you got human stresses inside of you that you're disguising it somewhere, you know, within your eye twitching or, you know, your body language or something going on. I'd sure like them to try to evaluate me. I got a schizophrenic personality, Jesus in me. <laughs> but anyways, my nonverbal communication is with God. Sometimes it's so cool. I mean it's just I get so thrilled over it that I just, I just, I just get a crack up and just start laughing and my wife has no idea what's going on. And uh, what it is is that, okay, you know, now I, I have times of prayer, you know, and I pray with God and I talk to God and I kind of do my thing with Him, you know, at different times, you know, sometimes to the Lord, sometimes to the Father, sometimes to the Spirit, sometimes to you know, different things, according to as the Spirit moves and wind blows and whoo, guess God's talking, but I... I'll think something. Now, in my mind, I'll be thinking, you know, I'll be, you know, like working the minister or something. And come, this thought will come to my mind. I'll go, you know, chicken sounds really good. You know, man, you know, like, well, yeah, I'd like to get some of that chicken down the street. You know, that that wing stuff. You know, that we've been getting. That was like from. I think it's called a. Am I going to do a shameless plug? Probably. Um, I want to say pizza pizza or something. I can't even think of Domino's, I think it is. Domino's maybe. Anyways, they got these kind of like little bowls of chicken wings, you know, with different flavors, you know. Man, I found one that's like garlic and parmesan, and I'm like, you know, gung ho on it. So, anyways, you know, sometime during the week, I'll say something like to myself, you know, not to my wife. I'll be thinking, man, you know, garlic and parmesan chicken sounds really good. Then I'll forget all about it. You know, it's kind of like, just one of those thoughts, you know, flit it in, flit it out. And I'll go on working, you know, and I'm busy doing my thing in the ministry, you know, and sharing devotionals and going on with, you know, Bible studies and, you know, postings and, you know, everything that I try to get in my brain, you know, because I'm trying to keep myself sane, you know, because in this world, it's insanity. But in so doing, it's like I forget all about what I thought. You know, my wife comes home, you know, she'll come home from work, you know, and took him in the door, you know, and I'll greet her and, you know, we'll visit for a second or two and I'll try to give her some quiet time, you know, to go out and have a cigarette. <laughs> you know that I'm going to get killed for that one. <laughs> we don't hide anything in this family. <laughs> Everything's out there. <laughs> so anyways, you know, she goes out down the other end of the porch, you know, and I've got this little kind of section set up where it's real nice, you know, it's kind of like got a god thing, you know, and it's got plants, you know, and it's got hanging plants, and 
just a chair that she really enjoys sitting in and it's comfortable and there's a blanket for her if it's too cold, you know, just all design, you know, and then I have a chair sitting next to her so she, I can sit next to her if I can sit upwind, because <laughs> if I'm downwind, I can't handle smoke from cigarettes. But anyway, she can sit there and it's got all the pretty little flowers that look like this, you know, a bunch of them all over the place, you know, trying to kill the smoke. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Don't take me serious. So anyways, you know, she, you know, will have her time, her quiet time, you know, and then she'll kind of come back in, you know, and, you know, either be doing her thing on Droid, you know, because she can't get on the computer because I'm busy. <laughs> anyways, you know, she'll come back to me, you know, and she'll, she'll say, let's go get some chicken. And I won't say a word. She'll say, let's go to Domino's, I guess that's it, and go get some chicken tonight. I'll say, okay. And I will go with just this beaming red face, just kind of like, I won't say a word. I don't tell her. Not me, man. She doesn't know it. I've been talking to God. And God's kind of coming through, and I just go. But as soon as I take that bite of chicken, I pick it up and go. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, you and me. <laughs> and I eat it. And man, every time too, I'm thrilled with it. So it's not just like with chicken. So because that would be, you know, like maybe it was a coincidence on a Wednesday, a Tuesday, or Thursday, or Friday, or something, you know, that comes up. No, I mean. It can be things like, I'll think of, you know, I think I want to go shopping tonight, you know, you know kind of like, you know, midweek, you know, let's just go check out the used stores. My wife will come home and say, honey, let's go check out the used stores. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dear. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times on little things that happens regularly with my wife and I. Now, no, we haven't been married 40 years, and no, we don't have a set routines, and we're not one of those types of people that could, you know, symbionically be identified, you know, as coercively, you know, knowing each other's habits or something. No, I'm not quite that way. I like to break my habits as quickly as possible because I, I seem to think that I'm in a rut if I got a habit. <laughs> but what God does, you know, because I'm talking to Him, and nobody knows that I'm thinking it, and nobody knows I'm talking it. And she doesn't know because I don't tell her, and she's never known because I don't tell her. Well, maybe I have now. Oops! The cat's out of the bag. <laughs> and the dog's chasing it. But, cool, because I'm allergic to cats. There goes the dog, and it's chasing a cat. <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding. Now somebody else is going to hate me for that one. But my point being is that I love that about God. My God. Now, that's my relationship with the Lord. I mean, it's really cool because my wife has seen other examples of that very personable Jesus in my life doing things for me that I can't do for myself. I mean, stupid things, I'll admit, that seem kind of dumb, but they're the little things that are important to me because, you see, my relationship, I don't care about the big things, you know. I could ask for a mega ministry, I expect I'd get it, you know. I could ask for, you know, raising the dead and I expect it would happen. I mean, those to, to me, those things are automatic. To me, those things are natural. That's just to be expected. What I don't expect are the little things of love, the little tokens of love that show that God's in the intricacies of the details, that he's very, very intimate and so real that he cares about even my Pepsis. I'll be sitting there and I'll be going, you know, like I'll even, I don't know, we'll have a couple Pepsis left in the refrigerator, you know, and if I happen to think that, you know, I think we're running out, and my wife has already gone and got them, you know. Because if I think that thought, she goes and gets them. If I don't think that thought, waits till we're out and then we go. It's kind of weird. But you know, what can I say? God and I, you know, we just have this little kind of thing and he loves me, you know. So he takes care of me. Maybe that's not a big deal to you. But you see, that's what makes God real for me. Not coincidence, not kismet, but the very aspect that there can be no way that it could happen any other way by any explanation except that God is real. Because no being could arrange the circumstances of another person's life to coordinate in such a way with all the things that I haven't mentioned with my wife and with coincidences or circumstances in our life that would make it fit in such a way that only a God or the God of gods, the Lord our God, could do it. And we know, I mean, I can demonstratively prove that. And that's why I wanted to get to this point, 
your faith should never be based on blind faith. You should never have some kind of like faith that says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence things not yet seen, and just blindly go out and say, I believe in that, or I believe in this, or I believe in this, and I believe in that, and not having proven to yourself what you can and can't pray for, ask for, or do. Because just having faith isn't what it's about. That's not what it's about. I don't have faith. Shoot, I just trust them. <laughs> I don't have much faith. You know, it's like, you ask me to heal you, I'll say, I'll ask God. You know, if God wants me to heal you, then I'll heal you. You know, but other than that, you know, and I don't care how much faith you got. If God don't want you healed, he ain't healing you. <laughs> Too bad. So sad. That's the way it goes. <laughs> but my point being is that you have to have an intelligent faith. And that intelligence comes from two things. One, your experience, and I don't mean experiencing God, because there's some people that say only experiential um, knowledge is the most important thing. No, it has to be a part of the Word of God being real in your life. In other words, being made revealed in your life. It becomes living in you because it becomes a manifestation of Jesus in your life, revealing how He works and operates by His Word. And that's what is so beautiful about devotionals because it talks about someone else's life and someone else's wisdom, but then it also inspires you to go on with your life so that you have wisdom, so that you have those personal little experiences with God where you have that divine intervention, so to speak. You have that inspirational connection, so to coordinate. You have that interlocution, if you want to call it that, of God and man where God whoosh, comes down into man. And man goes, glad I thought of it, and wanders away, you know. No, that's not how it happens. Not how it happens at all. God in you speaks a word, and it becomes so. Because that's how he did it in creation. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So God said that there be light, bing, there was light. You could say, if you wanted to, interpret this in a better way, when it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God. You could say that, and God said, and then Jesus spoke, let there be light, and there was light. You see, because the aspect of triunity of God, we know that the Spirit hovered over the waters so that there was an aspect of the Spirit there. We know that God the Father was there, and we know that Jesus was there. So, Jesus being the image of the incorruptible God, of the Spirit part, you know, we could say that Jesus spoke, you know, and spoke the part, but God said, let there be light, and then it says, let there be light. You see how those quotations kind of like, but we'll, we'll go there. That's kind of playing with, you know, interpretation of the word, item specific, you know, kind of theology. But anyways, getting back to the point, Jesus should be coming that real to you, because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another. You should be sitting down practically on a table, literally, and writing down specifically things you either want God to do, you expect God to do, God has said he would do, and then you can prove to yourself that your faith is real. You can demonstrate to yourself that God is moving in your life. Because if he's not, you're following a religious idea. You're theoretically idolizing faith or idolizing religion in some way that hasn't quite entered into relationship. Now I'll admit, just so you understand this, when you're first born again, now some people are kind of like cast into this, you know, pretty important part because sometimes when they're born again they immediately go into ministry. <laughs> some of us didn't have a choice. <laughs> oh well. But if you don't have much of an experience like when you get saved, it's just kind of like, well, I think I got saved, you know, I went forward and I did this, you know, and you kind of don't really feel nothing and you don't know God and you kind of like, you know, don't know anything. Well, being a baby spirit inside, so to speak, a baby at first doesn't know how to get what it wants or doesn't know how to communicate. So there is a process of development that goes on for a baby that has to gradually learn, you know, how to say more than... <laughs> and smile and cry, you know, because that's basically how usually most baby believer Christians are. They smile when they're smiled on and they cry when they're not, you know. And that's kind of the way they are, you know. As long as they're blessed, they're not a mess. But as soon as they mess up, they're crying. You know, and if they're not crying, they're whining. <laughs> uh, that's usually older Christians. But the point being is that the growing process is a growing development of knowing whom you believed in. 
knowing whom you serve, knowing who you are communicating with. And that should be ongoing. So make your faith and your calling and election sure by determining for yourself that you have that personal relationship with Jesus. That he has become, literally, just like I said, man, I just think it and God does it. It's not like I think it like Pentecostals like to say, I thought the word and she did it. No, bull. <laughs> That's so... Pardon the expression, it's an old expression, but cockamamie, you know, that's an old word that's used to mean that it's stupid. You know, it's just made up. It's just ridiculous. It's absurd. And in Christianity, there's a lot of absurd ideas because they take a little bit and they run with it and explode it into something huge and then make it into something it's not. It happens all the time. It's like God could say, Michael, I want you to go and I would run off before he finished the statement. Because as I heard the word go. But he would say, I want you to go into the other room and I'd be running down the street. See what I'm saying? In other words, if I ran off before God finished the statement, I wouldn't get the full meaning of his word. I wouldn't understand what he's saying. And sometimes that's what people do when they quote parts of scripture. It says, God won't give you anything bigger than you can handle. Baloney! But will with that temptation make a way to escape that you'll be able to bear? Oh, so he will give you something bigger than you can handle. Yeah! all the time so that he also gives you a way to get around it by escaping it you know like um you know the world's coming there's a way of escape you know it's too big for you to handle so guess what you need to get ready for a rapture and if you're not ready you ain't going <laughs> so check it but in all of that the beauty of that relationship that you should have should also instruct you in the way you should go because you see once you have a relationship like that, don't start falling into this trap of looking for something new. No, don't. Because even with me, you know, when you hear something I say, or you hear something somebody tells you that sounds new to you, or sounds kind of like, you know, different, and you're not sure where you should go, don't go with it. Don't sit down and try to prove it's true, because you'll probably prove yourself and use self-deception tools to prove that it's true for you. Or someone, if you ask them, you know, they'll use some technique on you that can really kind of lead you straight. Wait. Talk to your God. You know the voice of your Father. You know the voice of His Son. Jesus will guide you if you wait. If you don't know, it says, Any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who braideth not, but giveth to all men liberally. If any man lack wisdom. That should be a priority in your life, that whenever you don't know something, it doesn't say go looking around for everyone else to tell you what it means. It means you should ask God. And then He will lead you. Because if you go from, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, who giveth to all men liberally, and added Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to that, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not in thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. He will direct your path of learning wisdom through whatever tool he wants to use. I personally tell people, look, if you're hearing something you don't understand, and you start to promote it to other people and you kind of like trip them up with what you just thought was a good idea because you thought it was cool, Google it. Google it and see what other people have said about it. Google it and find out there's other people supporting it. Don't just go with one person's opinion and don't just follow somebody because you like them. Follow who saved you in the first place, Jesus. It wasn't your pastor, it wasn't your elder, it wasn't your deacon, it was Jesus. He will guide you and He will lead you. So that while you may think that maybe something I said, you know, is interesting, you know, and you jumped off, you know, the cliff over it, I'd say, well, that was pretty dumb. I didn't tell you to jump off the cliff. Well, yeah, you did. You said that you did once. And I said, well, you know what? I jumped off the cliff and I broke my leg, you know. <laughs> that doesn't mean that I told everyone else to go do it in order to learn. But I didn't jump off the cliff. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't thought of a cliff I can jump off of. Although I've been in some cliffhanger experiences. But you see what I'm saying? You need to follow the voice that you know, not the voice you don't know. So, however the Spirit of God is leading you, He will cause you to remember the things that Jesus said, and He will bring them to light, not bring something new to you. Don't go after everything new, because every time they come up with this new... I guarantee you within two or three years, or you could send me an email and I'll tell you. Yeah. Send me an email, I don't care, you know, or contact me on uh, Facebook or whatever. I'll tell you straight up, 
give his facts, you know. I don't have a problem answering. You know, something new, and I'll tell you if it's, you know, new like in off the wall or new like in maybe. I'll give you a probability factor so you can go for yourself and determine whether you believe it or not. But in examining those things, you know, if you don't know how, then, you know, then you could ask counselors. But for the most part, you really should stop, listen to your Lord, and listen to what he says to you each and every day. And as he directs you, you'll find your way. Because he promised it in that scripture we just talked about. In, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who abradeth not, but give him to him liberally. He will lead you into wisdom. Well, that's a good one. I wonder where that came from. I was like, well, I like that. Tomorrow's. That was like pretty cool. It's like, hey, can we read tomorrow's now? It looks pretty cool. Oh, well. Who wants to prophesy? Focus on God's promises. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. I am the Lord who says to you, fear not, I will help you. The Lord says to you this morning the same thing he told Jacob in a dream. I am with you and will keep you. Whatever you may, wherever you may go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done all of which I have told you. Keep your mind on this promise in spite of any news you may hear that tempts you to be afraid today. God promises to be with you. He promises to watch over you. He promises to watch you with care. He promises to take notice of you wherever you may go, and he promises to bring you back again. He says he will not leave you, and he will never leave you or forsake you. He promises he will complete all the promises he has made to you. This means that no weapon formed against you will prosper and all those promises that you have been learning and that you apply and that you find out that God has spoken to you, then those things will be done unto you or for you by God, not by you. It's not about your faith and believing in them. Really, it's not. It's just about letting Him do what He normally does, which will inspire you to do what you should do. Trust Him. You see, it always goes back to any lesson that you're learning really involves trust. Do you trust Him or don't you? Will you trust him or won't you? One way or another, you're going to boil it back down to the base nature of whether you have trust in him based upon your experiences of talking to him, growing in the knowledge of him every day as you suddenly discover that, yes, in little ways he's been talking to you. He's been showing you things. You've been discovering that he really is alive, that he has a way of communicating to you and that you are enjoying that and fellowshipping, so to speak, with it. That's what we call prayer, by the way. That's communication, not just petition. I know that there's kind of some confusion on that. Someday I'll get into prayer. But for the most part, prayer is meant to be communication, two-way. You know, like people do, you know, you and I. I don't even know it's one-sided right now. <laughs> oh, well, that's why it's not communication between you and I. It's inspiration. And I'm relating to you, not communicating to you. That's why I use the word relate. You see, I, I, I know what words mean. That's why I choose my words carefully. But you need to understand your God and walk with Him in a very intimate way so that you don't get distracted today by anything that comes your way. But you'll always go back to Him and ask Him, you know, they were saying this. What do you think, God? And I, you know, I'd like to say, God is my witness. You know, I don't say that because it's like, that's stupid, that's swear. But my point is, I have always, always gone back to God and said, Lord, show me. You know, and if I don't get it like within five seconds on Google, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> if I don't get it within five seconds, I'm done. No. I wait. I wait, and I won't follow it, I won't do it, I won't believe it until I've gotten God inspiring me with what I should know about it. And he knows what my questions are. And I'm not content to just go, it's okay. You know? And me and God have a thing going. You know? It's like, no, Lord, I'm sorry. That's not enough. I want more. You know? Give me more. Don't just tell me yes. I want more. And he's honored me with that. He's always led me. And as much as I hate to say it, I wish he wouldn't anymore. But he's always led me to discover and uncover the volume of truth about something, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's good, sometimes not so good. Sometimes it's humanity in action, sometimes it's God in action. Sometimes it's interaction of man and God, you know, working out something at that point in time in history that was needful for him to reveal himself in the way that he chose. Not that we would, but he chose to. So always seek 
Because in any given circumstance, I have no idea what you may go through. I have no idea what God may want you to do in that set of circumstances. But I do know that He knows, and He can lead you directly to the answer you're seeking. So trust Him. Follow Him. Do what He says. He really is that intimate. I'm a living example of it. I get a kick out of it. Like I said, it's just like, man, you know, it's just kind of... When I was whining about, you know, not enough rain... Oops! Okay, I wasn't whining, but I was thinking it. And... Oh well. I need to watch what I think about. But then again, I think that's what Jesus said to bring every thought in captivity to Him. So, if I were you, and I'm not, I would not be cynical about new things. I wouldn't be distrustful, but I would question God about everything. Because He doesn't mind if you question Him. That's not making Him angry. If anything, it's making Him 